Lydian Spin with Lydia Lunch, Tim Dahl, Vale, and Marion of Research Publications. We are in North Beach, San Francisco, home to a lot of beat culture, City Lights books. Used to be some incredible uh, burlesque theaters. Most of those are gone. Vale, what brought you to this neighborhood originally? And when did you land here in this compound of yours? My uncle brought me here when I was a little kid during the beat days, and he took me to three things I will never forget. He brought me to my first lesbian bar. I didn't even know what a lesbian was then. How I'm old were you? 14. Nice guy. From a small town. And where? A small town where? Oh, Nowhereville, USA. Population 1280. Nice. Wow. So, so uh, why did your uncle take you to a lesbian Because he was a beatnik. Okay. But the, beatniks have a thing When I say too. beatnik, people don't know that the beatniks were an American version of the French existentialists of the late 40s. It's the same thing, but you know, adopted to America and for America by Americans. My uncle on the G.I. Bill was in the same painting class that something like the Sorbonne in Paris right after World War II. My uncle had killed Germans, of course. Yeah. And he met Ferlinghetti at the painting class. They became friends, and he and Ferlinghetti kind of at the same time moved to San Francisco rather than New York, say. Right. Was this in the uh, mid-50s? Yeah, yeah, mid fifties, right. definitely. Because remember, Hal wasn't even read till nineteen fifty five, literally the mid fifties. But America didn't really know about the Beats probably till fifty nine when that great issue of Life magazine came right. out. I mean, that's what turned the Beats on to America. The pictures, pictures are very important. My uncle moved here and sort of became a. A small real estate mogul. He was smart. Like, that's the quickest way to make money and not work. Not work. He sold Ferlinghetti, I remember, a lot in Bolinas, which Ferlinghetti still has for $3,000. Of course, it's like worth 100 times that now, of course. at least. <laughs> so my uncle brought me up here. You know, I guess he wanted to edumacate me. <laughs> and uh, naturally, what would he do? He'd take me to the Black Hawk Jazz Bar which I was too young to get into, and the jazz workshop, but I could literally stand outside the front door and hear all the jazz. Who did you hear? I don't know at that early date. Okay. I only learned about jazz later, in the 60s, yep. going to UC Berkeley. Right. Is that good, how you, but good question. Is that how you got into playing music? I mean, when did you start playing music? Oh, I, was, I could always play music. I always had perfect pitch. Were you a child prodigy? Not a prodigy. What was your instrument? Piano. Yeah, cool. You, you know, you have you're born with certain gifts, and if you eventually you find out you have them, yeah. You know, and but you know, I always find when you have gifts, you should. I guess we like to challenge ourselves and um, try to pursue things that are weaknesses. But at this point, I realize you know what? Just know what you're fucking good at, because uh, otherwise, it's a real uphill battle. So, but you, <laughs> but you said you had to practice an hour a day. Oh, of course, kid, but everyone so. did. Yeah, that way. Yeah, that yeah. was that was everyone like did. everyone. You, you didn't have stage parents, right? It was just a no. discipline more than anything. Well, else. I did in a weird way because my father, you know, played Chairman Mao. You know, in the movie called The Chairman Opposite Gregory Peck. Okay. And he also was in a bunch of other Hollywood movies. He's on IMDb <laughs> as, as, as Conrad Yama. Mind you, I never knew my father. I, I always used to joke, I could pass him on the street and not know it was my father because my mother had no pictures. Wow. I think my mother hated him. When did he leave the picture? Before I was born. It Before was in you the, were born? Okay. Yeah, it was in the con I was born in a concentration camp in America, you know. Yeah. I didn't have anything to do with it, but it, it happened. And my, my father was, you know, he's an actor. You know, he can't trust those artist types. And he was having two women at the same time in the camp. But he married my mom so I could have a be legit, I guess. Do you but have memories of none. being in a concentration hell camp? Hell no, hell How no. How old were you when you I was got only out less than a, I was only in there less than a year. Yeah. Yeah, I don't remember a thing, but my mother, of course, told me, Grizzly tales yeah, that, that were not, I mean, they, they're kind of worse in retrospect. At the time, I just thought, oh, that's the way life is. <laughs> yeah, there, there must be a, there's like some kind of museum or a memorial in the, the probably a bunch. A bunch, yeah. But I'm weird because I grew up, before the age of seven, I grew up in foster homes. And so 
<laughs> my favorite was a Polish family in Peoria, Illinois. I loved them. They had such a great sense were of they, humor. Were uh, they Polish American? Were they like Polish American? They changed their name from the Ivanovskis to the Ivans family yep. to be okay. American. They make you go to church. You know, I don't remember church. I just remember going down a steep hill on a sled with three other kids. Cold winters, yeah, Peoria. So oh. where uh, Richard Pryor went from as well. <laughs> really? Oh yes. Wow. Born, he was he was born in a whorehouse. <laughs> Lucky him. His dad was a pimp and his mom was a prostitute. Wow. And that explains some of his behavior. Oh, yeah. Well, that's theater. Theater yeah. training. Oh, yes. Right well, there. He, he redirected it. That's for that, sure. That, Horrorhouses are definitely theaters. Oh, yes. They absurd are. for the most part. <laughs> so, when, so, back to your first involvement in music. So, you go from the beat bars, you're too young to get in, lesbian bars, for whatever reason your uncle wanted you to experience. And then what? What's the transition from being a 14-year-old on the streets of San Francisco to doing music with other people? The next fad that is, I think, underreported was what I call the folk music counterculture rebellion. People don't realize that there were like must have been thousands of kids all over America picking up folk guitars and yeah. hang down your head, Tom Dooley and. We shall overcome and stuff like but it was, that. But it was kind of neo folk. I mean, when the uh, well, we called it folk. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it was like we saw all the stars: Pete Seeger and yeah. Mal- Malvina Reynolds, Little Boxes. I didn't realize that Joan Baez. Joan Baez was hot. Was hot. She was Here. hot. The yeah. uh, I didn't realize that Peter Paul and Mary. That's a industry band. They didn't know each other beforehand. When folk was like in the industry, like like a boy band, they like they put them together. They never knew each other before. You're kidding, because they're really. I saw them as a kid. Yeah, well, they're you know, really good. You know, sometimes the industry knows what they're doing. I mean, not on my thing, but uh, I love those two albums. What I really loved was <laughs> Bob Dylan's notes on one of them. Oh, about, yeah, liner about, notes. I, I, liner I, notes, okay. because they just showed me that, oh, that's the lifestyle. We didn't have that word, mind you, then. Okay. But, you know, this is how, how to live. You know, you don't have a job. <laughs> there you go. So folk music is exploding, you're experiencing it, and then Well, I tried to be. Music. I tried to become a folk musician, and of course, I'm failure, but, or, <laughs> or let's say n- non-commercial distribution or recording or any of that. But then I, by sheer luck, of course I joined the next rebellion, the hippies, and the true summer of love, you know, was 66, not 67. 66 was it was still okay. All the rapists hadn't come, and the Charles Mansons. And the klepto capital. Well, it's mainly, it it was, I don't know, a lot of victims, actually. Running away from whatever. Uh, yeah, well, I saw a girl today on the bus, or was it yesterday? I was sad to see her. Oh, someone you knew from back. No, no, oh. no. This is You're some just new good, young girl. You just did girl, a, a read on neo her. Neo-hippie. Yeah. On the bus, like, like you can't wear it, go barefoot in San Francisco on the street. Why didn't you give her a pair of your shoes? Well, I didn't notice until she was getting off the oh, bus. I see. Maybe it could have well, given one well I have to admit, she was wearing very short, cut-off jeans. So I, I just, so Daisy I, Dukes and no shoes. All right. But she was talking in some accent no one could understand. What well, was she mentally ill? I think so. Okay. Back, back to the point now. We're, just, <laughs> we're trying to jump into your first foray into music. Oh, blue I hear chair. that at the time, I've seen, haven't seen the picture, but... Well, Mark I was... McLeod told us about seeing you when your hair was down to your hips. Yeah. All these undergrounds are just spread by very few people you know, spreading the virus. And in my case, it was this great white, white jazz aficionado slash reporter who had a weekly column, I mean a daily column in the San Francisco Chronicle. His name was Ralph J. Gleason. Like he welcomed, say, Bob Dylan and everyone else hated his voice, the quality, sonic quality. The timbre. But yeah. he, was, he welcomed Bob Dylan. I mean, he was an avant-garde guy in general. But he praised all the black jazz musicians. Remember, there was a time when white people didn't really listen to jazz. They hadn't heard of any of the artists. They didn't listen to black jazz, which was... Or blues or I mean, there, there was definitely white big band and stuff that they were into. Oh, I, I see what you mean. Yeah, yeah. So this uh, this guy, 
he was a he had a daily, daily, daily com, uh, yeah, you call him mostly what was he mostly critiquing jazz or I mean he, he, was, he, brought, he brought in Dylan he was kind of reporting on yeah on music so I say like anything new and so when the hippie thing started he re- reported on it and said yes there's men walking around with long hair in this neighborhood called the Haight Ashbury so naturally I went there right away and he told us about things like. There's going to be a trips festival in Longshoreman's Hall, mm-hmm. you know, with Ken Kesey and whom, who, Ken Kesey was actually famous then. He know. was already. Yeah. He was because of one flew over the cuckoo's nest. Yes, yes, yes. Anyway, so naturally I went to those. Yeah, yeah. Were you checking I, t- out? I took LSD before it was illegal. Let's put Wait, it what that year was way. it made illegal? Beats me. I, it, was, it, was, it was. I think it was right around sixty six, sixty seven, right? I think it was. It's probably more like sixty seven. Okay. Because I took it when I was at UC Berkeley, I guess, or something. Did that expand your mind incredibly? Uh, no. <laughs> wow. Okay. Why not? I mean, it was pretty. It was a lot stronger enough. back then too. Well, actually, it did. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's the reality. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah, but you have to have a guide who's not on LSD. And I had a, a great guy named Ben Collette that I totally lost touch with. But he, I guess he found the acid and drove me all around the most scenic, beautiful places in the Bay Area, like Sausalito. And New York Woods. And, and, well, almost. But... There's a great view on top of Twin Peaks that, that you probably haven't ever seen, but it's super high up, and you can just see everywhere. So you went there on acid? Yeah, of course. <laughs> and then he, and then I ended up in Washington Square Park, three blocks away, you know, which is all nice and green. And I had my first Pomoni ice cream cone. No, wow, all right. That was amazing. The way that it, was the first one you ever had. The day was, you took acid. It's an you amazing. That one? Ice cream. I don't know if they still make it. Oh, yes, they do. We have it in Brooklyn. All. But they have little gelatin lumps of different flavors. And on, on LSD, those flavors are just cosmically huge. <laughs> I mean, they taste amazing. I'm still trying to press you for the answer to the question I asked Oh, well, I tried to. You're, you're I was really in a, diversifying. Well, subject. you know, I, I tried to join a band. And my first band was just two blocks away up in... Up on Kearney Street, it was a. I had an 89 day temp job as a mailman, and it was another mailman starting a job uh, <laughs> band, and I joined his band. He had this song I remember called I Won't Try to Stop You. And then someone sarcastically commented, like, all the fight's gone out of him, right? <laughs> you know, like, I guess this girl was leaving him in the song lyrics. No. But, but no. anyway. That was the band, and then, then I moved. I found myself in the Haight Ashbury at six twenty four Ashbury Street. You could rent a room for twenty a month, your own room. I went regularly to the psychedelic shop. They had a little one ad by right by the door section, a little board, and I saw an ad said blues form band forming like Paul Butterfield and drummer wanted that's what it said see drummers are always the hardest thing to get or get a good rid- one a or good get one. rid of <laughs> yeah. or get rid of <laughs> I, wa- I said I wanted to visit them and I said don't you need a don't you need a keyboard player <laughs> so oh yeah sure <laughs> alright so it was loose yeah yeah but, but see I didn't know anything about what it really takes to start a band I mean you gotta have if you, if you don't have a a serious talent on board that can songwrite, you're dead. I mean, that's the point, well, is then, to meet that, people you can absolutely. songwrite with. Well, there's so many levels of how why a band's hard. I mean, the diplomacy, keeping it together, there's just so much shit. I agree. But get to Blue Cheer. Well. Because that's really the only possible na- musical name you were connected to other than your own magnificent talent playing the piano here, which I've occasionally heard. <laughs> Blue Cheer didn't start out as Blue Cheer. It was just a blues band. After I got kicked out of Blue Cheer, I tried to start at least two other bands. And then I began to realize that, hmm. Uh, well, what happened was sheer luck I got saved by meeting Philip Lamontia, who read it the first How reading, by the way. But he didn't read his own poetry. He read, uh, you know, this his friend's poetry. I forgot his friend's name. 
who Hansel? went, no, oh no, <laughs> no, it was John somebody. Guy ended up in a mental hospital in, <laughs> in Napa. And I remember Philip told me, yeah, I went to see what, whatever his name was. And, and uh, you know, we had a nice visit and we talked and all that. And, and at the end he said, well, if you see Philip Lamonti, you know, tell him hi for me. <laughs> like the guy <laughs> hadn't remembered him. And Philip's pretty memorable. <laughs> if, you remember, if you're ever around him, he, he's, you know, one of these autodidacts, one of these super precocious types like Lydia. He moved to New York in six, age 16 to work on View magazine. He dropped out of high school to go to New York to work on View magazine because at age 14, he was so blown away by a surrealist exhibition at SF MoMA that that just became his... Obsession. 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 His focus is driving him. And he, what I think, he sent a poem to Andre Breton, who called him the voice. He's a voice that rises only once in a century. Anyway, talk about Mr. Know-it-all precociousness, knowing all everything that you were not taught in school, know-it-all. Yeah, well, those you know, all these amazing books. All, he, he knows everything about so-called occult books, but not in this horrible underground goth way. Uh, or, you know, the, there are all these crazy people into the occult, like around Genesis P. Orridge types. <laughs> but um, he, no, he knows the real deal on the cult and, and can quote... He had this photographic memory that I, that I so envied. He would just say, oh, yeah, and he'd recite a paragraph from a book, and you'd go check it later. Yeah, I guess he got it. <laughs> what year do you think, because San Francisco has been a hotbed of also, like, not only occultists, but every kind of weirdo at one time or another, from whether it was beat, whether it was jazz, whether it was then the hippies, the folk, the occultists, Way the before. Poems. Yeah. Yeah, we had, remember, we had legal whorehouses one block away on yeah. Pacific Ave. Until a long, when? Until I don't, well, the Barbary long. Coast. Yeah. But, and remember, we really did have Shanghai going on with secret tunnels in Chinatown. You know, the ships would come and they'd need sailors and they'd just kidnap them and send them down this tunnel and the sailors would wake up on a boat bound for China or something. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> After a drunken that, hence out the, the word house. Shanghai. Right. They Shanghai literally Shanghai'd. to Shanghai. <laughs> drunken night in the whorehouse leads to a slow boat to China. That's, That's what right. I would say. You've put out so many books. I mean, we're jumping ahead here because otherwise we're going to be talking for the, the rest of your life, which is not a bad idea. We've already been talking to each other for about 30 years, Val. I think since 85. Well, you can do the math if you want to. That's when you stayed here with... Two boys. Again, <laughs> as usual. Henry, who became famous, Henry Rollins and Jim Thurwell. At the same time? Yeah, that's my memory. Well, I'm not going to count on you for that one, but that's all right. But <laughs> around the same time. Yeah. So uh, we go from uh, the Barbary Coast to punk rock. But I did meet you in 79. You just don't remember. Why would I? Oh, yeah, why would you exactly? Where did I meet you in 79? At the map when I saw you play. That's what I'm talking because about. Because Mark I Pauline wasn't. set off the loudest explosion I've ever heard in an in confined space just be as a prelude act to her act. Mark Pauline of I Survival Research the, Laboratories. I think it cleared the place. Although I did say punk <laughs> rock. It does although it. I did say punk rock and I have never been punk rock. You were still in 79 going to shows that were a few. Our scene ended in 78, but we went to your show, but very few others. No, I can understand I, And that. I went to, I was friends with Jellyby Office, so I went to a few more after 78, but... But before 78, who were you going to see? Well, what do you mean? Everyone You're, under the sun. Well, a few names would be useful. <laughs> well, I mean, obviously, we had a club one block from where I'm sitting, called the Mabuhai Gardens, run by Filipinos, and it was the only place that would tolerate punk rock to start. In April 77, we had, it got jammed. And I think it's because it got promoted on local radio. That's, that's what the flaw was. And you had, um, in the same room that normally held 200 people uh, or more, you had, the draw was Iggy Pop, David Bowie and Blondie all here. Wow. 
and with a party afterwards that was great, in which the blondie guy, I saw him kicking the glass door of the party. I, I thought that was, wow, those people from New York are like harder core or something. I saw Clem, the drummer, kicking the, or break the glass door kicking it. So would you say the party was better at that point, or did that kind of stop the party? No, it didn't have any impact whatsoever. Well, you you remember that detail, so obviously well, I remember. Impact. I was shocked. I said, "These people from New York are harder core than we are." Well, of course we were. <laughs> and um, I mean, we wouldn't do that here. And and then there was just a party as usual. It was at, found out later he's some kind of drug dealer. I guess his name was Super Joel. I think he's long dead. I hope. And um, <laughs> and he had a building. I guess he owned the building or something, and it was a warehousey building. And on the side where you could see it said "Art for Art's Sake," but it was misspelled. You know, it wasn't A R A R. It wasn't A R T for A R T apostrophe S sake. It was just A R T for A R T sake. Get it? Anyway, I thought it was a pun. I thought that had to be deliberate. No one could be that illiterate. <laughs> Of course, you can never count on anything these days. Well, but that's where the party was. So. That's, that's where the party was. <laughs> but before then, it was the Mabuhai, and, and I'd never seen so many people before or since there. And it was pretty low key spectacular with everyone pretending not to stare at Bowie and Iggy and all that. You can imagine. And Blondie, of course. Well, it was hard to keep your eyes off of Debbie Harry in 77. Oh, I'm glad you say that. Yeah, but, but, you know. I mean, I'd oh, plug my ears, but I couldn't stop looking we, at her. No, she's beautiful and, and kind of quiet and nice when you talk to her. I talked to her, but I never interviewed her. Because everyone else in the staff were just chafing at the, no, I want to interview her. No, I want to When did you start her. doing interviews, which eventually led to your publishing? I don't even know how many books. Well, Search and Destroy started in spring of 77 when there was hardly any punk scene. I put out a recent book, and it has some of my earliest punk photos before when you can see that nobody is in the audience and everyone who is in the audience does not look punk. <laughs> Take my word for it. We're not UK where everyone's so fashion forward ahead of miles ahead of everyone else. This is San Francisco, small town. And Who were some of the people you photographed? I have very early Ramones photos, but there's a particular memorable one which there's absolutely no one in the club. It was the Keystone Berkeley. At least in San Francisco, there are 40 people, maybe 30, but there was like no one. In so Berkeley. you decided to be, to start Search and Destroy yeah. because the punk scene consisted of 40 people. No, because I knew it was the next major countercultural revolution from the standpoint of ideas. It's always ideas and principles that are be underneath everything. That everyone's just fooled by the exteriors, and that that's why they. They say, oh, he's got long hair, he's not punk, you know, stuff like that. But I knew the principles, uh, this this is like ha sort of a hardcore tell it the truth, not exactly working class realism, but kind of close to that. I hate to tell you, you probably don't like her, but I, what, uh, don't assume. what, what I, uh, what was a wake-up call was I had a mail-order piss factory from 74 because as working at City Lights, I read all the New York media because I could and it was free and I could. I was in charge of magazine returns, which would meant that I really would steal everything and just send the mastheads back to the distributor so City Lights wasn't ripped off. So I was tracking punk at 73, and I, again, I thought it was a poetry movement because I was fooled by the reports about Patti Smith and Sam Shepard reading together, and it sounded like something's happening there. Well, Piss Factory is one of the best singles so, ever recorded. I think it's so. Any, it's her best piece of writing. It's her best. It's absolutely great. Sometimes you get it right the first time, then you just keep trying she to find that it. same thing. No, a lot of times, you know, first thought, best thought, earliest work, best work. It's sad, but that happens a lot. If you can just imagine being back then, you can you couldn't believe something like that was recorded, and you thought what? And then you realize this is a new movement with a totally different aesthetic than the hippies say. It's like my three-word phrase is aesthetics determine consumerism. 
This is a totally radical new set of aesthetics. Take yeah. my word for it. Yeah. John Waters talks about that, how the radical counterculture now is not conspicuous, and that's why it's so confusing. It's anonymous now, where you know hippies, punks, it's aesthetics that are conspicuously uh, showcased. And then now it's, Mom, can I have an ice cream? And coming in from your bedroom after shutting down a bank on your fucking computer. It's, <laughs> it's uh, very different. Well, I think if anyone's trying to do anything, it's all these kids in Berkeley I know that dress like clowns. I mean, they just have the you wildest. You didn't even see the joke. You didn't even see Joker yet. <laughs> no, no. There's but, kids in Berkeley dressing like clowns. Yeah, well, I think they dress like what are clowns. What sitting they, here? They've been doing this for years. They just combine the weirdest color combinations oh, yeah, and that. patterns, and bright too. That I've ever seen. So what are they doing besides patchwork clothing? They're in all in indie bands. Oh, okay. You want to name any of them? And they're all noise bands. You've never heard of any of them. You never will. Well, you're, I might not, never many. hear of them. Maybe other people want to hear of them. Okay. Well, I just happen to know the two members of this band called Dingbat Superminx, a name I don't approve of. <laughs> D-I-N-G-B-A-T Superminx, S-U-P-E-R-M-I-N. Well, so, so I don't know what it like means. I think we know how to spell fashion's that. like their, their, their band name. It's just kind of like grab bag or something. It's just, all... uh, it's, just it's like, what? You know, it's, <laughs> it's, 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 beyond, it's beyond psychedelic. It's just, you don't know where it's coming from. Either... Or gender-wise, either. That's another thing. The avant-garde is all beyond gender now and all this. I feel sorry for myself. <laughs> well, band, <laughs> band is kind of a glorious word for the dingbats because I think they had a bad box playing some already pre-recorded music by somebody oh, else even. And then they were up there singing and you know showing Dancing. off their clothes and stuff. Yeah. And they also, everywhere they travel and tour, they, they get all their friends to be on stage. So it looks like a big deal. A big, a big party, yeah. But it's really two or people. Or they just plug in their iPhone. Oh, there's that oh they, that's it. They travel with an iPhone. That's the band. Yeah, they're, they're back, pre-recorded backing tracks is what you're saying. Or Apparently. Yeah. All right, you, you were just talking about gender being divided or coming together now as one. But a lot of the early books you put out with research deal with hyper-macho intellectuals who are still off the center mark. Well, I mean, we know well Burroughs' history. We know that, you know, it's weird to say he was macho, but he was extremely well, he was the man. He I was mean, the man. I, I, mean, he, well, I always suspected he was working for the man. Oh, come on. Yeah, I know. But, was anybody uh, that smart? Well, I, I think I liked it better when before, when, when all the so-called queers were closeted. I think I liked it better. Why? Uh, because, because it was just more fun to look at the clothes. Uh, you know, uh, like guys would send <laughs> signals out that they were gay by wearing red socks. No hetero would wear red socks. No that's hetero just, should wear red pants. That's just a key, or what do you call it, a signifier. Like the blue hanky out of the you know right pocket means you know I'm a masochist and I'm looking for a sadist top. Or wasn't you know, it which like ear that. was pierced? <laughs> oh, the, was and the, one yeah, of them. and which ear is pierced? That's old. You know, but I like I like it when things were subtle. I guess and it was it just seemed like more fun to me. So, so, so you, yeah, you like uh, intolerance and attention and uh, and basically transgression based yeah. on these like no, I th rigidity of society. I like intolerance because I think intolerance breeds rebellion. Well, yeah, sure. I mean, I mean, yeah, I, I mean, everyone's too. Pr See, here's what's good about punk. I, I know because I'm not white. It was the first time that all these white people actually had to sort of experience othering, like what it's like to be other. You know, yeah. uh, like, because we got yelled at from cars and shit. Yeah. And that's in tolerant San Francisco. I'd hate to think what it would be like in Oakland or Hayward over there. Or Omaha. Or Omaha. Much less Omaha. You could be, <laughs> you could be killed there just for looking a little weird. Well, like, that, that's like, the thing. It's like uh, we're, the danger of on the, you know, the cutting edge of any movement, the danger, at least for me, is always the the exciting moment, you know, after society has filtered it for 40 years and it's been refined and all the permutations have been explored, it's so stale to me at that fucking point. Oh, no, no, everything's more fun at the beginning. Yeah. Everything. Before people can have it classified. They, look, they didn't even call us punks at the beginning. They didn't know the word. They were so dumb. 
They called us. <laughs> they called us fag. But a, but, but we had girls with us. But a, but were a punk cute. in prison is is, is, a, is a punk. Is, is a, yeah, I know that bottom. word. I, I yeah, know yeah, that yeah. word. All right, let's cut it. Let's let's just jump, jump ahead here to the chase and let's get to the real point of this conversation, which is the incredible collection of intellectual minds you've published. Let's just get really to the point. That's why it's we're here the, at Research Publications. They're all rebels, and they're all in the punk movement, which you disdain, but that, that's well, one no, that's I disdain, way to, that's way to bring rebels together, you I, know. I disdain and it, being it's called a, punk. Yeah, but it's also a way to get your records sold because the regular record stores wouldn't stock your records. Well, I never cared about that. Though, did well, I? yeah, well, you, well, you do want your records to be sold wow. I mean, rather than not sold. No, I wanted my records to be documented. And therefore, well, sold. that's why I still own all of it. I'd rather hear them listen to for free, actually. That's what, to me, I'm very happy with the internet in the sense that you can hear all the stuff you could not experience the first time around. It's not that precious. That, that is true. I never thought I would get paid for releasing records. I knew I would get paid for, for doing concerts. performances. Well, that's what it is now. All the musicians, they only make money on touring and live shows. They well, what else is new? People have been ripped off forever. There was one short period of musical history where people were overpaid at the expense right. of not paying anybody else. It was tokenism where this band would be paid millions of dollars to be forever cock-blocked into a record deal, and then nobody else gets any money. It's the way it's always been. And now just nobody gets paid, unless you're a corporate uh, prostitute. I think Miley right? Cyrus gets paid. Well, unless you're a corporate well, prostitute. There's a lot of, there's a lot of li that's like licensing for brands and stuff like that. It's not based yeah, on oh, record right. sales. Yeah. There's a lot of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's it's just amazing to me. The main change to me has been it's always economics. Whenever you want to know what's really going on, you always ask what are the underlying economics, not what you can see. Well, and, and also the the peripheral economics. I mean, I mean, drug dealing. You're not peripheral uh, anymore. No, I was, I was saying. I always say that with the music now, music culturally had such a in terms of popular music such a huge impact, but. Us musicians, or at least me, I'm like, oh, right, not that many people actually like the music. They went to the concert to get laid, to get drugs, and, and like now, like with laser accuracy on the internet, it's like, oh, I want to do X, Y, and Z, and there's a person around the corner that wants to do the exact same thing now, and they like me, and, and to broach those conversations, if you're into something weird, you'd get punched before, so it's like- Tinder whoring. It's, it's, it's basically, so what's left now is like the music fans, and you're like- a little quiet out there, actually. What's well, going on? Well, that's what Tinder was good for. So you, you, you're you're traveling in Europe, and you want to know someone who to hang out with just because <laughs> you, go on, you go on Tinder. And, oh, yeah, you know, oh, yeah. enough <laughs> of the same references. All the philosophizing in the world is still not getting us to the point of what you've actually achieved in your life. So can we really just kind of pimp you for a minute here, Vale? Let's not underestimate the reason why we're here. We are surrounded by a collection of books by radical intellectuals that you have compiled, put out, published, continue to publish. Just rattle off a few names. I'm sorry to push my pimping, but you got to do it. That's why we're here. Yeah, but all the names I've published, no one's famous. Well, I mean, oh, J.G. Ballard. 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 Well, Burroughs. okay, okay. Burroughs. William Burroughs, J.G. Ballard. I am their definite champions. I was determined that everyone in the so-called punk underground should know who both names were. And Ballard was not known in America. No, ba not Burroughs sort of was, kind of, but definitely not Ballard. And I hope I turned a few people on to Ballard, at least. But there's still a lot of work to be done in that area. Then, of course, my favorite musician of all time is not a musician, it's Mark Pauline, who invented his own genre. He, he, I remember real early. I met him in 78. Laboratory. Big, destructive machines yes. of sonic, unbelievable, destructive qualities. And dynamite and like flame shooting everywhere. And the loudest sounds you've ever heard in your life if you ever went to a show. And, and you'd be, often be singed by fire from a flame cannon just missing in your head. He invented his own genre. He stole all the city, abandoned city lots that he staged them in. He didn't ask permission or get permits. He just, Big, ugly machines. Yeah. Probably uh, that would or deadly. should kill you. They, they could kill you, but he is actually very conscientious. No one has ever been heard at an SRL yeah. show. But he does have super loud explosions. What was that book that you put out featuring Mark Pauline? Well, I've done several. 
I, I put him in search and destroy number 11 because I didn't meet him till probably around November 78, October, when I was winding down the punk publication. And then I remember he one thing he said right away, something funny, he says, I'll never be a photographer or will I ever play guitar. I just thought that was funny. <laughs> well, Why play a you? guitar when you can play a big machine that makes that the you loudest invent. noise you've ever heard? Yeah, exactly. The guitar and becomes kind of obsolete at that point. <laughs> he knows a lot about music. That's a crazy thing. He had these soundtracks that were deliberately curated, is that the word? Yes. To try and turn off the people who would normally go to his shows like, what? Why is he playing this stuff? He would pick weird stuff, almost trying to offend those people. It was it was really oh, yeah. funny, and he'd play like funny disco songs. I mean, when disco was not cool at all. And uh, yeah, to me, it never was. But carry on. Well, to me, it was. I'll tell you why. I went. To, I, I've. 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 I'm sorry. I've been there for all these. All these fads. We had a place down here called Dance Your Ass Off. Very early disco. First time they had a TV, local TV show associated with it, so you could see it. And this is absolutely first time in history I've seen it was okay for black people to dance with white people. And it was huge for the gay culture, too. I mean, it was, it was a lot of... We didn't know about that till a little later. Okay. But you're right. But it was there. But see, people were still closeted more than you remember. The way you liked it, yeah. I like, yeah, the way I like it. I think oppression is good for artists. You still have a few good dance moves under your belt there, um, Vale? I never danced. I was up in the, I was always up in the balcony watching. I, I'm an anthropologist. You had a good description once about how you bought all the clothes and you oh, bought the God. platform shoes and the belt. Oh, you had a disco suit. Oh, sure. Well, 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 you have to. Was it white? Was it like uh, John Travolta? Volta, what was it? No, was it? they had these gold fabric shirts you could buy, and boy, would they stink after wow. yeah, if you got any sweat in them. Yeah, but now they have antibacterial coatings on polyester. They didn't have them then. Don't get boy, them started it, on clothing. Boy, did it stink. Why, why not? That disco stink of well, B.O. Tim, can, tell you can, a, I, can I ask Tim you can that? tell you a little bit about a gold, or in his case, a silver shirt stinking. Yeah. Because one of or his gold. bands, I, well, my, my one band. of his band... My band Child Abuse. We had a uh, we, trio we, 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 of silver we, we, suited. We had silver. I'll show you a picture later. Silver kind of disco suits. And, and boy, did they have a fragrance oh boy, unlike that, any other. It was uh, it was pungent because these were pungent. not antibacterial. And, and the thing about with, with those kind of glittery silver things. You can't put them in the washing machine because they're ruined. It, all that shit comes you off. You have to hand wash them. So, I know. Even, I've even lived if you, it. Even if you, but I, my I've pants, lived it. You have to swing. use that cold stuff. What's it called? But can I ask you this? Do you still have that disco costume? Oh, no. Ah, shucks. <laughs> no, I, I don't even have my ex original Sex Pistols t-shirts I got sold that are now worth thousands. Oh, yeah, they're worth a lot of money. But you're yeah. a moron to spend that kind of no, money on an original No, I, I don't have those. I just got rid of them. My book and my so-called influence can be measured by my book titles. That's why whenever I work a book fair with all my books, I say my life is here on this table. And I think that the books that had the most influence were pranks. I know several members of Survival Research Labs personally told me they moved from Idaho or God knows where to join SR after reading the pranks book. I said, hooray. And then I know that my Incredibly Strange Films book caused the reissue of like literally thousands of unheard very of B important movies. Book, very important book. It caused the reissue of hundreds, thousands of movies that no one heard of. And I know I've B, sparked, C, and D grade movies. Yeah, B, yeah, B C, D to Z. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, B to Z movies. Yeah, Brought B, to B you to by Z. research publications. And I know that my... strange films. I know my... Beautiful book. Thank you. And my, I know that my Incredibly Strange Music book definitely jump-started a bunch of forgotten musician careers because I befriended uh, Martin Denny and I was at his house in Hawaii when a $25,000 check came in wow. for which he thanked me for publicizing him in Incredibly Strange Music because that sparked a second career from some record label. Likewise, uh, Jean-Jacques Perry oh, they both said had that. gone into retirement, and he had to find him like the day before he moved out of Paris and stopped 
working. Yeah. And then he and got the, his career going. He got his career going. Yeah. Then. Yeah. Jean Jacques Perry. Incredibly strange films, pranks, incredibly strange music have had an influence, and then Angry Women. Which uh, I was in, thank which, you very much, yes. and many other incredible female characters, artists, musicians, writers, radicals. Yeah, I've had thousands of women over the last 30 years almost telling me that angry women changed my life. And a lot of them were introduced to it in college in feminism classes. And I remember that for a brief moment, Diamanda Galas hated me. Who didn't she hate for a brief moment or even all of <laughs> well, her life? Well, well... Oh, I well, love Diamond. No, I, I, I have the she's, highest... She's rather delicate. I, I have the highest respect for her, but, but we had a huge fight because I m stupidly made the mistake of sending her the transcript of the interview. I'll never do that again, although I did. So, but it was... And she cut out about four-fifths of it. Oh, wow. And I said, no, I'm the editor. You said it. You knew you were being taped for a research. I am the editor. And I restored it all. And then I saw her after the book had come out, and I thought, oh, shit. Because yeah. she's coming down the aisle at a book fair mm -hmm. Wild towards Wild Women me. with Steak Knives yeah. is not just the title of a track on one of her. Would she threaten you or something? <laughs> well, I expected the worst, and instead she hugged me and said, your book changed my life. Really? She said, I'd gotten all these offers at university classes to give lectures and presentations. And she was really happy. All right, so so do you, do you mind to like you? I well, guess. that was then for that day. We don't yeah, know. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. We don't know anything about other people like that. Yeah, and so I, I just know that Angry Women was one of my best books. And, and that's all you can do. Here's, here's why Ballard nailed the power of a book. See, there's not many people who read books anymore, and I feel sorry for them. But he said, when you read a book... You are closer to someone than even someone you're sleeping with where they may not know, where you may not know what they're really thinking. <laughs> and I agree. <laughs> when, when you read a book and, you know, and you're reading it, you're one-on-one -on -one with someone's mind for a sustained narrative. The words are melting in your mind and becoming part of your mind, and you're stealing them from, for your vocabulary, whether you know it or not. Right. And it's a very intimate experience, but the key is that you have to expose yourself to the best writers. I say that it's not, when I say best, I mean put it in my goals of life sheet. Try to be around the most genius, rebellious, and funniest people you can find or meet. That's, I, that's I, I, I can agree with that. That's what brings <laughs> us to this compound, because many radical, hilarious Brilliant people have and sat rebellious here, have sat here, vomiting permanent for rebe <laughs> per per permanent rebellion. Permanent rebellion. You know why? Because the status quo is very quick at co-opting you, and they're constantly co-opting you and changing, and you have to change to fight them or or to not be them or whatever you call it. Yeah, not to be. The status quo is hijacked. always changing, so you have to mutate. Well, adaptability. Yeah. To stay against the status quo, you have to keep mutating as the status quo mutates. And that's why we're in the weirdest stage now. I think it's funny, but I just think it's weird. Where I know a lot of, not a lot, but I know certain young, i.e. to me, someone in their 20s and 30s is young. I know these people that are rebellious, but they're also striking deals with <laughs> And making tons of money, <laughs> getting corporate sponsors. You do? Who are they? <laughs> well, if only they, they would share that wealth. I, I distribute yeah. it in the direction where it most belongs. Ex ex exactly. They're very slow on that. They don't. They haven't been taught that's the path. Share the wealth. And what is give back. how would you share the wealth? Let's say you, someone just handed you a million dollars from a Nike well, and, sponsorship. And, trust well, me, I support a lot of people in the, the best ways that I can. Well, wouldn't you like, yes, even I, though they don't make any money, put oh. out their records or no, something? No, I would give them the money. I don't care about putting out their records. They can do the music as they want to, but I'd rather just give people give them a grant. Bills. Thousands of dollars. Well, know. that's what Ginsburg I mean, that's was why good I at still, doing. That's why I still employ musicians. Do you think I need them? I want them, and I like to pay them. 
Well, the, the filthy rich are not known to but that's uh, share of, that that's much. Not of, you they know, don't get that rich by sharing. That's not a very. That's the thing is, we come out of a community based concept of the extended family helping in whatever way you can. That's what an underground whether is. Whether it's with food, a place to stay, a free whatever. book, whatever. We come out of that mentality because many of the we had genres to. or cliques that we were actually birthed from, it was about a small amount of people yes. doing what they could to encourage or inspire other people. And so we had this collective concept of sharing whatever it was you had. Well, no, you also try to help everyone as much as you can. And that's why you release books. And in, in a result, you've helped many people by exposing them. The ideas. To ideas. By exposing their ideas to, to the rest of the world, or at least a, a select view of intellectual people that are hungry and for more alternate, information. And alternate ways to live and somehow survive. <laughs> oh, that's the outside yeah, world. Yeah, exactly. I think, that, I think that's, that's my pimp. On that note. Yes. <laughs> this has been the Lydian Spin with Lydia Lunch, Tim Dahl. Landline. Or is, or is that a cyborg? That's a landline. Is there a cyborg in here? <laughs> is that Miley calling? Is oh, it's someone at the door. Could be Eugene. Oh, Eugene. Oh. All right, we got to close this one up anyway. The Lydian Spin, Lydia Lunch, Tim Dahl, Vail Research Publications, Marion piping in a few times whenever she could fit a word in.